Hi, I'm Scott Jones. I'm acting director of Electronic Frontiers Georgia. And this evening's, um, this evening's presentation is What's All the Fuss About Apple's CSAM Solution? And our speaker tonight is Joe Mullen from EFF. Uh, Joe, if you could start by introducing yourself and then uh, kind of lay out uh, what Apple proposed and remind us again what CSAM stands for. Sure. Um, my name is Joe Mullen. I work on the activism team at EFF, and I work on a few different issues, including encryption, uh, which is how this issue came across my desk. Uh, I um, so we've been. I'm going to kind of give an overview of the work we've been doing on this issue. Uh, I've been at EFF for three years and a bit. I've been working on encryption issues for most of that time. Um, so Apple proposed, I'm going to uh, share my screen here and show a timeline. Uh, OK, I should start sharing in just a second. Um, in early August, Apple came to us and explained that they were going to roll out some new features in the new version of iOS that they said had to do with child safety. They are going to introduce two types of scanning on all of their devices, uh, one of which would scan for what's now called CSAM and what used to be called child pornography. So the new acronym for this is child sexual abuse images. Uh, and they were going to put a new feature on their phones that would have an on-device uh, scanner that would search through people's photos. Uh, it was uh, photos that were had iCloud switched on, and it would scan them against a uh, essentially a government database, a database that's maintained by an organization called NICMIC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It's a quasi-governmental agency, and uh, Apple would be scanning against those and reporting matches uh, onto law enforcement. They were also going to do a second type of scanning for the phones of, or the devices of minors in family accounts, which would be a more general type of scanning for really nudity. Anything that uh, their machine learning algorithm had determined was, quote, sexually explicit. Uh, what does that mean? I don't really know. <laughs> That's a culturally dependent term. We don't know where it would have gone for Apple. Um, and the feature hasn't rolled out, which we're happy about. So uh, that's what we got. That, that phrase is the phrase they use to describe the second type of skin. So we have been working on this issue for about a month. Uh, we think both types of scanning are very problematic. Uh, this came up on us a bit by surprise. Apple, I want to give a timeline here of uh, how this issue came up. Um, Apple told us that they were going to announce it a couple days before they did. Uh, they told a variety of organizations, um, civil society, maybe some press, I don't really know the full array of people they reached out to, but they announced it two days later on August 5th, uh, and we responded the same day that they rolled out their announcement. So their uh, feature is described on a, a page they created called Child Safety. It's apple.com slash child safety. They released an FAQ, and then we wrote a response post. Um, basically saying, and I'll, I'll show that post now. Let's see. Um, and I want to, this page we've made is, um, it's, you can reach it just by going to EFF.org slash Apple. And what we've put on this page now, we had a, a petition up, but what we have now is kind of a general information page that links to everything we've done. So this is the, this is the post we put up on August 5th, which is the day that Apple came out with its, uh, with its plan. And this is, the, let me give some of the context here. Um, the government in different forms, particularly the FBI, but other agencies too, have been 
complaining about the strength of online encryption for over 20 years now. Um, there are some agencies in the government that are very bothered that there are some messages that they can't read. Um, and they think that they should have access to every message that's exchanged online. Um, EFF disagrees with that point of view. We always have. And we think you should be able to have a private conversation in the digital world, just like you have a private conversation in real life. Um, we don't think that it conflicts with the goal of um, doing good law enforcement or finding people that are doing bad things. <laughs> um, so we've resisted a number of these efforts over the years. Um, and as I think the, the public discourse about encryption has kind of changed and there's been a more widespread public understanding of why we need encryption for privacy and security online. Um, what we have seen now are kind of different ways to wordsmith around it. Um, and there have been a few examples of these just in the few years that I've been working the encryption group. So we saw from out of the UK, there was like a, what was called the ghost proposal where UK intelligence agencies kind of floated the idea that they would have a, you know, they would be a party to, they would be added into private chats as a third party and that somehow this wouldn't break encryption. Um, so we had to kind of write about that. Well, you know, encryption is really, it's like, when we talk about end-to-end -end encryption, it's an idea, it's a, it's a promise that you're making that only the sender of the message and the recipient of the message have access to it. And there's ways you can break that promise even if you don't break the actual encryption algorithm. So for example, um, these are some blog posts we put up in 2019 where the new way to talk around it was client-side scanning. And the idea is if you have some kind of scanner that's on the device um, and just finds and reports bad stuff, then somehow you are maintaining encryption um, while still being able to service a law enforcement demand of doing some type of searching, some type of looking for information. So, you know, we actually have blog posts in a sense about this out before it happened. And I'm going to apologize again for that. There's a quite a bit of background noise. They're paving the um, streets outside my apartment, which is extremely exciting for my two-year-old son, but um, sometimes disrupts my, my video chats in the era of the home office. Um, so this is... What we see this as is also kind of a, a version of um, client-side scanning. Uh, and it, so it's something that it really it breaks the promise of end-to-end -end encryption, even if it doesn't literally break the encryption. And um, so we see this as another, um, sorry, I'm going to go back to the timeline here, um, another version of uh, what we've been seeing for a long time, which is essentially trying to create some kind of backdoor for government agencies or quasi-government agency to be able to um, look at people's messages. And we, so we had a response, I'm going to go through kind of the timeline of our response here. We had, we started by publishing some blog posts. We, we wrote a general response post the same day as their announcement. Um, we wrote a post about the global implications of this, which are, are really concerning. Um, because we see this as something that's um, inevitably going to be subject to, if, if and when it is rolled out, it will be, it's a scanning system that's um, going to be catnip for governments that already have uh, not just surveillance, but in some case, online censorship regimes already in place. Um, so there, we think they will, you know, insist on utilizing this technology. And while Apple has said flat out that they'll resist that pressure, um, which is an admirable thing to, to say, 
uh, that's not exactly the tack we want them to take because we don't think they're going to be the first um, corporation in history to, um, you know, resist, uh, resist, you know, dozens of governments around the world who ultimately have authority over them and their employees. We think the best thing to do is to not build systems that can be abused. Um, so we wrote about the global implications in a, in a post on August 11th. Uh, Apple started sort of changing their system um, within some days of hearing a lot of pushback from us and from others. Um, and later in August, we launched a petition. We decided that we wanted to let give a format for users to be able to speak out about this and say that they weren't happy with this program and they wanted Apple to withdraw it. That petition ultimately got over 27,000 signatures. The same day that our petition launched, two other, or, well, two other organizations launched petitions. One of them came the same day as ours. Fight for the Future um, is an, another online organization that deals with freedom in the digital world. They launched a petition the same day as us. Theirs ultimately got about over 16,000. And then there's an organization that's based in Canada called Open Media that had a similar petition called I Surveil. Ultimately, the three of us decided that we would do a joint event. Um, and we would hold a press conference and present those petitions uh, together on the same day to Apple. Um, so we did that. That happened on September 8th. Um, we also had a, a, there was a coalition that was organized by the Center for Democracy and Technology of a lot of different nonprofits and NGOs that were opposed to this program. They ultimately had, uh, I think, 90 organizations. Um, so anyhow, there was a, a big public outcry at a number of levels. Apple has said they're delaying the program, which we're happy about. Um, but we went ahead with our petition delivery. We also held protests in front of Apple stores in eight different cities. That was the day before their big press event, which was on September 14th. Um, and we went forward with that. You know, we did get asked by some reporters and, and other folks, you know, this, this program seems to be dead in the water for now. So, you know, why are you still moving forward with it? But it was important for us to move forward with it because to say, you know, we weren't going to be silent about it in September. Uh, I think to some degree, you know, these things happen in a political atmosphere. And I think a lot of different forces in society, not just Apple, are sort of taking measure of what the response looks like. And it's important for us that, you know, during a month that is commercially important, frankly, for Apple and, and all the technology, technology companies that are consumer focused have pretty significant fall events um, because, you know, the holidays are such an important time for, for sales for our whole economy. Um, so we weren't going to uh, back away from our protest or activism plans um, at a time like that because we wanted to, we wanted to insert the debate into that press cycle. And I think we were really successful at that. We had some great success just, um, not just in sort of regular press uptake, but also in social media. We flew a banner over Apple's headquarters and um, did some kind of like fun and attention getting things like that. Um, so that is kind of where it stands right now. I mean, discussions continue. There's an update on Apple's post that says, you know, that they are delaying it, but they're still thinking about moving forward. But um, instead of just kind of going on on a monologue, I thought I would sort of stop there and see what this group, which is a group I'm new to, would be interested in me following up on. Um, there's a lot of different things we could talk about, uh, but this is this has dominated not just my workflow, but um, several other people at EFF for the past uh, few weeks now, and. That's where it stands right now. We feel we feel good about what's been accomplished. You know, we're taking this notice of a delay as a win for now. Um, EFF is at the end of the day, you know, a law firm, and I'm not a lawyer. I, I worked in a tech journalism and 
policy journalism for over a decade before I came to EFF. But I've been writing about lawyers and working with lawyers for a long time. Now, and one thing I've learned is, you know, victories come in different forms. And sometimes what happens is, you know, the organization or person you're dealing with kind of just stops doing the thing that you were complaining about. And they don't necessarily write a public letter of apology saying they see the light and they've changed their ways. Um, as much as sometimes, you know, you'd like that to be the result. That's, that's not always how it works out. Um, so I thought I would pause here and let uh, the folks that are in the group here maybe direct the discussion a bit. Um, I see some notes and one question in the channel, which I'm, I'll answer that question that Keith has in the channel um, and give other folks a minute to ask a question too. And so I can hear what part of this is most interesting to you or you'd like to know more about whether it's what Apple's doing or how EFF works and we came up with our response or whatever you'd like to hear. And I'm going to keep drinking water because I got a uh, cold to just, fortunately I got it after we did our protest, but uh, just staying hydrated. Okay. And also uh, Kivas has, has raised their hand. And so after Keith's question, if you could uh, move on to, to Kivas also. Okay, sure. Um, so, yeah, Keith's question is, isn't Apple capitulating to China and Russia already? And yeah, they have taken um, actions in the Chinese market. And so, you know, I think that's, um, we, and then what, God, this is, I'm having a moment where it just escaped me, but there was some item that was a pretty big headline just in the last week or so where, uh, um, yeah, the op right. This is the Russian thing that there was an opposition app that Google and Apple were told flat out, take it out of the store. And it was just a nakedly political move and they capitulated. I mean, they both did it. So the idea that they wouldn't, um, you know, capitulate on a sort of possibly a higher stakes issue that was presented to them in a more threatening way about their own systems is kind of hard to believe. And that was, that app was, um, the kind of thing that if you live in a democratic country where people are able to choose your own leaders, it's the kind of thing that's absolutely critical to our freedom. It was like a voter guide app of who the opposition candidates are that we think are good. You know, the kind of um, content that uh, we kind of take for granted our, our right to do that here. Um, so yeah, there are those capitulations. And we've had discussions about, you know, how could we elevate, you know, Apple's commitment if they're serious about what they're saying? Um, well, what could we ask for on that? And um, so we're thinking about how we could, you know, ask for, for example, specific written commitments that if they were asked to do ty that type of scanning, they would leave a market. You know, they would they would just decline to be in that market rather than capitulate to the demand. And I don't really think that's going to be possible. I, I don't see a U.S. tech company agreeing to get out of the Chinese market, for instance, which is probably the first country people think of when we get one of the first people think of when we get concerned about um, a demand for censorship. Yeah, thank you for posting that that link to the Navalny story. That's exactly what I was thinking of, but couldn't couldn't name. Um, so was there a? Sorry, was it Kivis who had the next question? Yeah, I see Kivis is typing. Um, oh, there we go. There's the question. Oh, okay. So the question is, for those malicious governments, can the technology be repurposed for them, or is it hidden or obfuscated slash encrypted? Domestically, I'm not sure I see the issue if the scanners are accurate, because it seems they won't get any info other than an indicator of the photo being CCM or not. So, okay, so I, let me take what I think is the second part of that question, excuse me, first. Um, this Because the two types of scanning work pretty differently. In terms of the scanner that's looking for CSAM, yeah, it's it's scanning against a list of 
known images um, that are the database is controlled by NCMEC. The way the procedure would have worked is that Apple would have gotten a flag if there were hashes of the image that matched the CCM database. And if there were a certain number of them, then it, that would get forwarded to Apple. It was more than one. Um, then Apple had a second layer of uh, review, which was they were going to do a human review to make sure it wasn't a false positive. And then after that, they would forward it to law enforcement. So that's how it works. And, you know, there's other companies that do scanning that's similar to this. Um, and in some ways, you know, Apple did put in, you know, we'll, I'll give them credit for saying they put in some additional safeguards that other companies don't have. But I think the reason they did some of those things is because they honestly thought that there wouldn't, they somehow thought there was not going to be opposition from civil society. And actually, there was a lot. Because, you know, just in the fact that there is some of it out there, and in some ways, to be melodramatic about it, like this is one of the last forts to fall. There's a lot of other companies that um, do this already. <laughs> um, but Apple made a particular commitment on privacy. So there's, there's a few things that are different about this. One is Apple has marketed themselves as the privacy company. And they say they take privacy really seriously. Two is... The fact that other people are doing it doesn't make it right. The, philosophically, the concept that they're operating on is, well, we're not going to look at your stuff except for this one thing, this one crime, because we think it's really bad. So we don't think your stuff should be proactively, preemptively scanned because that would be treating you like a criminal, but for this one thing we will because we've been asked so many times by so many different agencies and everyone agrees it's such a bad thing and we put in these safeguards and we had to stand up on this one and say, no, there's kind of no but, but, but at the end of the day, this is mass surveillance. It's a type of scanning you're doing where you assume that a user could be a criminal and then you check to make sure that they're not a criminal. Um, and it's a type of scanning that's done, it's not in the interest of the user, it's not done for a feature that helps the user, um, it's not under control of the user, and it is about sending information to a third party. So those are like three big red flags that are things that um, are bad for users, that controlling governments want to use and abuse, and that we don't accept and we're gonna speak out against. So, and they did this with terrorism in 2016. <laughs> And at that time, we were protesting in front of an Apple store, again, same Apple store, in favor of Apple, because they stood up to the government and they said, we're not going to build a back door into our software. We've cooperated and given you a lot of stuff, but we're not going to endanger the privacy and security of all our users to make life a little easier for law enforcement. Um, and they did the right thing. And now the, they're, in many ways, the same organizations are back. And the line this time, instead of terrorism, is about child safety and CSAM. Um, so there's, there's a new crime that they want to scan for, but we kind of, we have to give the same answer. And we gave it loud and proud. And, and part of that was, too, you know, Apple's promises. It was 2019 when Apple put out uh, their big privacy, that's iPhone, campaign. Um, you know, what happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. Um, so a pretty direct promise to users that they wouldn't be doing something like this. And I would add, you know, that was a global campaign. So, you know, if you, if you do a Google search on images from that Apple ad campaign, it was not just in, you'll see billboards in San Francisco or New York and other cities in America. And there's also a billboard in Dubai. Um, 
where it's illegal to be LGBT. I mean, you can be thrown in jail just for being who you are. Um, and there's a lot of other freedoms that exist in the West that don't exist in other countries. So when you say privacy, that's iPhone, and you put it on an Arabic language billboard in the busiest airport in the Middle East, that's a big promise. And when you have it link to an Arabic language website where you explain that at Apple we believe privacy is a fundamental human right, that's a big promise. And I think users have a role in saying you don't get to just roll back that promise uh, you know, 18 months or two years later. Because those are people that really have uh, very valid reasons to not want the government to scan anything on their phones um, and not want to know about their, their personal life or what images they share of, of who's buying. It's just really none of anyone's business. And there are things that they will, they're up against dangerous forces that will portray things as crimes. <laughs> Um, so that's what this is about. It's about Apple, you know, asking Apple to keep their promises. So that's a long answer. I want to try to, let's see if I can get to another. Tevis, I hope I answered your question there as well as I could. Um, yeah, and I want to say there's, there's false positive issues with both of these types of scanning. Um, it's a more limited problem with that when you're scanning against a particular database, which they are for the, the CCM scanner, that is, you know, they can legitimately say it's going to be extremely limited to the false positives. I mean, you can spoof those scanner, scanners if you're working to, to spoof them. But in the case of the machine learning one for minors, it's like, well, they sort of almost acknowledge that that would have a lot of false positives. I mean, there's no way to not have false positives on that, in part because um, what people view as sexually explicit changes from culture to culture, um, even within the United States, not to mention China is not the US, is not Sweden. Um, so I think that would have been really problematic. And there's a whole other set of issues that went with that scanner that I haven't talked that much about. But um, yeah. Um, OK, any additional questions? Um, KitKat, did you have something? I don't have any questions. Okay. And the rest are, I guess, comments. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys for your um, your interest and your thoughtful commentary on this. So yeah. I had I had heard that this would only be supported in iOS 15. I wondered if it's um if it's there in iOS 15 and it's asleep, um, or if it would require an update? Um, we're pretty sure it's going to require an update. I think they told us it would require an update. Um, our, before they told us about the delay, uh, I would say we had an unofficial impression that this would be rolled out in an update to 15 that would come around December. Um, don't quote me on that times 10 because I don't know, but that, I would say that was our unofficial understanding. Um, since they've announced the delay, we don't have a timeline because they haven't told us how long the delay will be other than months. They said that the delay is for the purpose of listening and we're glad about that. We think they are gonna talk to us again and they're gonna talk to some other civil society groups that they didn't talk to the first time. Um, I think part of the problem is that they felt like they had talked to child protection experts and what they really, who they really talked to is, is NICMIC, which is a quasi governmental agency, gets its budget from the federal government, was created by the federal government, created by Congress in order to work with law enforcement. It's fine. They have a job to do, but they're not an independent NGO. Um, and 
they're not the only voice that you need to talk to. Um, yeah, and I haven't talked that much about the scanning for minors, but you know we're pretty concerned about that too. Um, that's a lot broader form of scanning that's going to have more false positives, and uh, we think it has the intention to you know a lot of um, we think it has a lot of bad possibilities. It could just affect, uh, you know, minors have the right to a private conversation too. And we just don't know what those false positives are going to look like, but we've definitely heard from LGBT groups that feel like those types of scanners end up targeting them and treating them like they're the bad guys. Um, and that's not good. <laughs> and, the other thing is like it will rope other people into a dragnet surveillance. So Apple's Apple's promise on the family plan as well. This is only the, the this is only going to happen if the parents in a family plan opt in, right? But so for example, like an example of a potential false positive in that would be, you know, let's say I take a, you know, a family picture of my two-year-old running naked on the beach or playing in the bathtub and I send it to a family email list and one of the people are message lists of you know six people one of them is my 17 year old nephew who's on this scanning program well then he's gonna get a message from Apple saying are you sure you want to view this picture all kinds of flags are gonna go off um, you know and so we think it's it's not good to be sending messages from an authority about people's images being bad or problematic or criminal um, when there are serious false positives that are coming around. And so Apple, in that scanner, they emphasize things like, well, Apple will never know about it. But um, it can still cause damage to people's relationships and to, to life. Um, so, yeah. So I wonder if it would have some of the same biases that the facial recognition has, such as operating differently on darker skin colors. Um, it's just hard to know when. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to know when you don't have it in front of you. Right. And we didn't, uh, you know, our tech folks asked to ask them some specific questions like what kind of, uh, I'm going to, the right phrase here is going to escape me, but maybe someone else knows it. But, you know, when you have a machine learning thing, there's inputs um, into that. So what are they going to learn to detect sexually explicit material? You know, some of that, they're drawing the inputs for how they build their machine learning um, will come from media that's out there. So, like, you know, it can come from, like, mainstream pornography, for example, if you're trying to just build a machine learning for sexually explicit material, and that's, you know, again, that's going to be like reflective of like one type of sexuality that's going to have, it's going to overrepresent some body types, some skin colors, it's going to have all kinds of biases um, built into it. Um, there's, a, there's a good question in the channel, what's your opinion if Apple moved their scanning to um, their iCloud servers that's an important question because um you know in some sense it's right like well they could just uh scan the cloud um uh i think there is you know there are certain issues where like if we had if we had to say is it worse i think there's some people at eff that feel apple scanning is kind of worse in some sense because it's on the device and i certainly think there's people that i've talked to that just feel it has a feel to it um that's a bit uh creepier but you know and we there's sort of this uh you could speculate about why they're doing it i mean we've been asking cloud services including apple to encrypt their their cloud 
um, and we got some positive developments from, from WhatsApp on that front pretty recently. Um, you know, I mean, we think in general, if you're promising privacy in cloud storage, then you should deliver on that. So if you're promising encryption and privacy on the cloud, then um, you should deliver on it. It's a complicated question, right? Because um, as the service provider, as the storage provider, it's also legitimate to say, you know, we don't want our cloud and our servers to be used for anything malicious or criminal. You know, that's understandable. So there's kind of a hypothetical like, well, if, you know, if the scanning was disclosed, um, then would that be okay? I mean, you know, I, I guess the answer would be we wouldn't like it if it was replacing a private service. <laughs> like if you're taking away someone's privacy by doing a certain type of scanning, um, it's, it's better to disclose that. Um, but we think there should also be space for end-to-end uh, -end encrypted conversations and end-to-end -end encryption on, on storage as well. Well, don't, isn't there also a fundamental question about how we're governed? The fundamental principles of the, of the Constitution, the Bill of, Bill of Rights, This is uh, a continued attempt by the government to put pressure to in do incursions where most people don't think they have the right to go as a government. Now, normally, if I, a neighbor decided that he believes in the uh, I have nothing to hide argument, which is a false argument, and he thinks there's no problem with it, well, he doesn't have much effect because he's just one guy. But if that guy happens to be the president or the CEO of Apple, he can literally affect the entire world with an attitude that most people would not agree with when it comes to our rights and privacy. And that's also part of this. People feel not only betrayed in the sense that Apple made a promise that they seem to be going back on, but also in the sense that they've got somebody that uh, is not the government, so they can't yell the government boogeyman argument, and but at the same time is siding with the government boogeyman that everybody's afraid of, and that scares people, and rightfully so. And there's nothing we can do to control that except vote with our wallets. Yeah, those are some great points. Um, Canary asked in the channel, what countries will the human CSAM checkers be based in? We know very little about that human review step. Um, Apple just told us that there will be human review. Um, that's it. I imagine it's going to be US based because they're only rolling out this feature in the US for now. That was one of the things they, they told us. Um, and there's a lot of, I, I don't, didn't even begin to know the details of how you do a human review of an illegal image. I mean, CSAM is kind of the, um, has this special legal place because it's, it's a type of content that's not protected by the first amendment and viewing it is itself a crime. So I imagine that you work, they would be working directly with law enforcement to even the staff create the human review system. Yeah, but we already um, know there's hash collisions. We already know they've had hash collisions. So we know that AI makes mistakes. So if you took those pictures of your wife or your kids or something that you consider very private with your phone, and suddenly you've got people some, that you don't know somewhere reviewing the private photos that you have simply because the system inappropriately, they decide it was an inappropriate flag. But now other people, other than the people you've chosen to share those photos with are now being seen by other people you don't know you have no control over that and frankly you have no control over what those people do with those photos it's like sending an email to somebody it doesn't necessarily remain private 
that can happen with this content too. So that's another issue. What happens when somebody breaks in and downloads 100 gigabytes worth of photos out of Apple's database and releases it on the web, and now all your photos are out there? So yeah, there's there's some things to this that get seriously creepy. If I encrypt a if I encrypt a photo because I want it to remain private, there's nothing illegal about the content. I just want it to remain private. When I put it up on the internet to store it, I fully expect it to remain encrypted and only accessible by the people I choose to have it accessible by. And this completely undermines an entire process. Says no, except if we deem it necessary, we'll look at it. But you don't get any control over that. And yeah, my immediate take on that is, well, I'll never own another Apple product. <laughs> but if Apple does this, count on every other company going the same way. Yeah, I mean, Google is probably, I think I've been told Google scans its cloud, uh, you know, for CSAM right now. Um, so it's not like we can tell people, you know, we'd like Apple to keep its promise. I mean, in a way it was kind of a, it was kind of a win for society at large that Apple put into end encryption as a default on iMessage and we'd like them to get back to that. We're hopeful that they, they will. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you know, time, Time changes. Like I said, five years ago, we were protesting sort of in favor of Apple and the stance they were taking. Um, and that's not the case today. And the options are getting, you know, it can be, the options are limited, right? I mean, especially think about how there will continue to be, um, you know, end to end encrypted products and messaging services. But we also want it to be a thing that's mainstream and kind of, you know, we want privacy by default because that's better protection for people like journalists and activists and people trying to tell the truth about what's going on in their societies and the world around them. We don't want them to have to f download maybe an unusual privacy specialized app that then just, just by virtue of them having it might raise suspicion or flag them in some way. We kind of want privacy protective features to really be mainstream and to be a, to be a default, not something that you have to seek out some sort of, you know, highly specialized thing that not that many people um, use. Yeah, people unfortunately feel safe on the internet. And what they don't realize is like, I, f I feel safe here in my house from attack by Spetsnaz, which is the Russian special forces. I feel safe because they got to come across borders and I got armies between me and them and all of that. But on the internet, the Spetsnaz or the organized crime or the cyber warriors in China are literally my next door neighbor. And there is nothing between me and them. So when you start seeing these type of on fundamental security being eroded, it's not just between me and Apple. It's not just between me and the government. It's between me and every other person on the internet, which is all the other bad actors of the world. That's the scary part. People don't realize that when you lower that shield to our government, you lower it to everybody. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for this opportunity. I'm going to have to sign off now. Um, I have a to go pick up my child. Okay. Uh, um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'll um, uh, go ahead, but then I'll I'll need to shut off the recording and when, once we close it down, and then those people are who are here, we can stay and socialize for a while. Great. Well, it was great to meet you all and get a chance to talk about this. And um, you know, Scott has my email and. Uh, if you want to do it again, reach out and, you know, we'll, we'll, as we say in the journalism business, only time will tell. So who knows what's going to happen in the future. But thank you guys for your time and the opportunity. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and shut off the recording now.